is uh, they can speak and uh, listen Korean. So while I'm uh, talking to the Korean, so I'm going to use Korean, okay? Excuse, excuse me. 제가 양해를 미리 안 구하고 그냥 한국말로 해서 미안합니다. 아, 이 캐슬린 유만 아, 보스턴 어, 그 캠퍼스의 그 메사추세츠 대학 총장님은 아, 그 리스킬링 인 아메리카라고 2016년에 책을 쓰셔서 그 책을 쓴 인연으로 오늘 발표를 하시게 됐습니다. 그 총장님께서는 아, 버클리 대학에서 어, 문화 인류학으로 박사학위를 하시고 버클리 대학에서 어, 학생들을 가르치기 시작해서 어, 하바드 대학, 콜롬비아 대학, 존스하킨스 대학 어, 어, 그리고 지금은 어, 메사수 대학에 계신데 제가 아까 물어봤어요 아, 왜 이렇게 학교를 자꾸 옮기시냐 어, 무엇이 이 총장님으로 하여금 이렇게 학교를 옮기게 했냐 물어봤더니 예, 자기는 그 말하자면 가난한 학생들, 어, 모자란 학생들 가르치러 도와주러 갔는데 하버드에 가 보니까 별로 없어서 어, 다시 예, 예, 콜롬비아로 가고 콜롬비아서 또 거기 저그 메나탄에 예, 콜롬비아에 가서 또그좀 어, 부족한 학생들이 있나 해서 가르치고 보니까 또 없어서. 어, 다시 프린스턴으로 다시 존스킨스로 드디어 이제 메사추세츠에 정착을 하셔서 어, 총장이 됐는데 자기가 그 총장이란 것 때문에 여기 온게 아니고 어, 문화인류학자 사회학자로서 그 미들스킬 레벨에 에, 그런 어, 근로자들의 업스킬을 연구한 그 연구 결과 때문에 여기 오셨다 그래서 오늘 아마 거기에 관해서 발표를 해주실 겁니다. 그 다음에 두 번째로 발표해 주실, 주실 연사분은 아주 젊으신 아, 그러나 미남인 예, 예, 치텅당 <웃음> 한국어로 번역하면 양기동 씨예요 <웃음> 양기동 네, 치텅당 예. 아, 이분은 그 어, HR 어네리티스 HR 어네리티스의 말하자면 그 스타트업 회사입니다 그래서 제가 뭘 소개를 해줬으면 좋겠냐 물었더니 저희가 그 HR 데이터와 테크놀로지로서 어 피플 디시즌을 갖다가 도와주는 그런 회사를 하고 있다는 걸꼭 얘기해 달라고 그러고 어 저희가 캠브리지에서 어 경제학을 하고 콜롬비아에서 정치학을 했다는 것도 꼭 소개해 달라는 거예요. 가만히 듣고 보니까 좀 괜찮 좋은 대학이더라고요. 예. 예. 그래서 우리 치텅랑 그 대표께서는 그 자기 회사에서 어떻게 피플 디시즌을 도와주고 있는지 구체적으로 설명하실 겁니다. 그 다음에 세 번째로 우리 우리나라의 큰 기업인 포스코. 포스코는 아까 제가 그랬어요. 포스코는 스틸 메이커고 우리 포스, 포스코 인재 창조원의 어, 유선희 박사님은 스킬 메이커 아닌가 이렇게 물어봤어요. 스틸 메이커, 스킬 메이커 같은 학렬 같습니다만 어, 우리, 에, 우리 에, 유 박사님은 그 플로리다 스테이트 유니버티에서 어, 통계학과 아, 스테티스트 앤드 매저먼트를 전공하시고 어, 삼성인력개발원에 근무했습니다. 그래서 어, 삼성인력개발원에 근무할 때 제가 배웠는데 온 세월이 빨리 흘러서 어, 저는 은퇴했고 아직도 현직 있습니다. <웃음> 아, 그래서 이 박사님께서는 아, 포스코가 어떻게 인재를 창조하고 있는지 특히 앞으로 어, 50년간 AI와 더불어 어떻게 에, 포스코가 성장하고 포스코 구성원들이 성장할지에 대해서 구체적인 사례를 발표해 주시겠습니다. 한분한분 한분 발표하실 때마다 아, 큰 박수로 성원해 주시면 고맙겠습니다. 그럼 첫 번째 에, 연사로 우리 메사추세츠 대학의 캐서린 유만 총장님을 큰 박수로 모시겠습니다. Thank you so much. If you don't mind, I'm going to sit here so I can see my slides. We got our slides up? 아, 슬라이드 좀 올려주세요. 네. Great. Well, first I want to apologize for not speaking Korean. I don't speak Korean and that's my loss. 
And I hope these slides will be intelligible to you because they're pretty tiny print, which is why I have to sit here and read them myself. But I'm here to talk today about the AI challenge to middle skill jobs. Middle skill jobs are the largest numbers of jobs in the United States, and they are probably the most endangered by AI, but in ways that I hope to argue today are not straightforward, not simple, and important to understand in their complexity. So let me just try to define first what a middle skill job is. A middle skill job requires education beyond high school, but less than a college degree. About 50% of all new jobs in the United States between 2012 and 2022 will be of this type, middle skill jobs. These are jobs that require vocational training. More than half of the top 30 growth jobs are in this category. They include manufacturing, marketing, sales, and service, and you can see the percentages here, transportation, distribution, and logistics, business, management, and administration, and hospitality and tourism. And among those five categories, you see this large number of jobs in the United States and in other countries. Let me begin by looking at some of these categories in somewhat more detail. First of all, manufacturing is ranked sixth in the growth of, in growth industries in the United States. More than 500,000 jobs were added just in the six years between 2010 and 2016 in this category. And that includes middle skill jobs like machine operators, industrial mechanics, electricians, computer controlled machine tool operations, engineering technicians, expert drafters, electrical and electronics engineering technicians, some of the people that you see in your steel mills. These are among the highest paid jobs in the United States that do not require a college degree. And they are surprisingly difficult to find skilled workers to fill. More than 600,000 of those jobs, about 5% of all U.S. manufacturing positions at any given time, are going wanting for lack of skilled labor to fill those jobs. But what about services, trades, and middle skilled jobs? Because they're not just in manufacturing. Here we see the fastest projected job growth in my country between 2010 and 2020. And so in those service jobs, this includes things like the medical fields, very fast growing, especially in a society that's aging. You'll see heavy expenditure in the medical fields. Personal care, home health care aides, dental hygienists, respiratory therapists, these are the kinds of jobs that, again, tend to require beyond a high school degree, but not as far as a college diploma. Police officers, paralegals, skilled construction trades, carpenters, brick masons, stone masons, pipe layers, and even web developers and computer network support specialists. So these are the services, trades, um, and part of the middle skill job band. Now, what is artificial intelligence and automation going to do to jobs like these? Again, remember, these are among the fastest growing jobs in the United States. So the first thing we need to recognize is that AI doesn't actually, um, sorry, I just want to be sure you got the right slide there. It doesn't automate entire jobs. AI tends to automate part of a job, not a whole job. People process information on the job. Computers process information by executing instructions. And not all jobs can be boiled down to simple instructions. So automation, AI, requires that instructions have to specify an action for every single contingency. And that's not possible for all jobs. It's not easy. Many tasks cannot be simplified to this extent. So for example, even though customer service has been automated by AI to a large degree, we still have customer service agents. Why do we have those agents? Because many tasks can't be defined down to this level. And because predictive models are by definition not right all the time, we have to have the opportunity for human beings to answer those questions that can't be easily predicted. 
So cases that fall outside the boundaries of the data that we use to develop predictive models for autonomous vehicles, for example, or legal cases, are going to be treated still by human beings. As the scholar Frank Levy, who's done so much important work on this topic from MIT, has noted, computers cannot participate in sustained, unstructured human interaction. So any kind of job that requires that kind of communication is not going to be a candidate for AI. So what does this mean with respect to how the job market is going to be affected as these trends toward automation continue? The best predictions I know of suggest that there's going to be a slow polarization of labor markets. Artificial intelligence is going to create a lot of high-skilled jobs while it slowly eliminates lower-skilled jobs. Some kinds of automation are going to produce demands for whole new jobs. Networks, robotics creates jobs for equipment installation and maintenance. The demand for rapid delivery of goods creates jobs for drivers. As volume grows, capital intensivity grows, jobs grow. But middle skilled jobs that involve a lot of, or a high proportion of routine transactions, those are the jobs that are going to be significantly rearranged or disappear. So for example, bank tellers. ATM machines lowered the cost of running branch banks and so the number of banks grew, and the number of tellers remained constant. They became much more productive. The arc of change affected these jobs in a differential fashion. Between 2008 and 2016, tellers started to decline. 100,000 jobs or so were lost by that time, but enough of the job is unstructured and involves human interaction that it slows the rate of job loss. Another good example that gives us a feeling for how AI affects jobs in a differential fashion is medical transcriptionists for radiology reports. Those jobs may actually disappear completely because they don't involve any human interaction. So the level of human interaction, the unpredictable nature of some aspects of the job, the ways in which rules cannot completely capture the nature of decisions made on the job will slow the rate at which artificial intelligence will completely destroy a job category. How will AI affect service work? Again, jobs that require unstructured conversation and extensive physical movement are not likely to succumb to AI. So we are still probably going to have janitors cleaning buildings, and we will still have home health aides. Those kinds of behaviors, those kinds of physical behaviors are not easily displaced by AI. But jobs that require repetitive movement and no interaction are going to disappear, as we know from assembly line robotics. Jobs that are a mixture of these two characteristics will see the repetitive or rule-driven part disappear and the rest remain, which will upskill the workers who remain. So for example, lawyers. Document review, which lawyers engage in a great deal, will devolve much more to automated predictive coding. But that's only about 13% of what lawyers do. The high-skilled end, developing arguments, plotting strategy, that will remain. So a large part of what we see is this job polarization with the high skill end remaining and the overall characteristics of the labor market then becoming upskilled. What about job losses then? Well, Levy estimates that AI job losses will be disproportionately blue collar, clerical and other mid-skill jobs and estimates that about 1.7 million mid-skilled jobs were actually lost in the United States between 2000 and 2016. That roughly the same number of lower wage jobs increased in domains like food preparation and serving or maintenance. This is what leads someone like Levy to conclude that AI will not cause mass unemployment, but will cause occupational polarization. And if we go forward, 
Long distance trucking, for example, is likely to be replaced by autonomous long distance trucks starting maybe five years from now. Automated customer response will replace customer service representatives to a degree and will wipe out some of the projected job growth. And industrial robots are likely to replace assembly line workers for a loss of about 200, 216,000 jobs in the United States. So what are the remedies for job polarization? Well, the first thing we need to do is to think about job ladders that create escalators from the bottom to mid-skill jobs that remain in abundance. Job ladders are a very important part of how we retrain people and enable them to see a way forward even when the jobs around them are changing. We need to develop continuous upskilling platforms for incumbent workers through bespoke online education. And we will hear later on in this, uh, in this conference from our colleague at Udacity, which makes a whole industry out of this. Workers will no longer, as we said before, be content to or be able to rest with simply holding uh, education to one period of their lives. They will have to be continuously educated and constantly upskilled. We will need to complement classroom learning, whether it's online or face-to-face, with shop floor experience, firm-specific skills, through functions like apprenticeship. So it's not enough for people to be in a classroom or even online. Those will provide them with general skills. They will also need firm-specific skills, which are best achieved through on-the-job experience or on-the-shop floor training in apprenticeship. In some countries, we see a heavy use or enlistment of experienced workers as master teachers. So the German Meister system, for example, comes to mind as an excellent example of where workers who are very, very experienced become then teachers of the next generation of workers. It will also be important to create nationally recognized certification systems that are rigorous and exam-based so that employers know exactly what kinds of skills people coming out of these credential systems have to offer them. Finally, we're going to need to invest in education in all forms in order to address skills mismatch. And this is not a simple matter, especially not in my country. So what are some of the barriers to implementation of a program like the one I've just described? First, we find in the United States, employers often complain about the difficulty of finding skilled workers, but they're unwilling to pay for the cost of training. They constantly cite the so-called free rider problem, in which they worry that if they invest in training, that worker will go somewhere else and use that training resource in another company. This is not a universal experience or feeling. I never heard, in all of the research I did in Germany, I never heard a German employer complaining or worrying about free riders. But in the United States, you hear it all the time. So there, it's required that we have a more collective understanding of the training process and not quite as much of a worry about how exact training investments map on to a particular firm. In the United States and elsewhere in the, in the world, the financing of this kind of extended education needs work. Our financial aid systems for students are adapted to traditional college-age students and are not in any way adapted to continuous learning. If we're going to finance this properly, we need to make it possible for people to actually achieve this kind of investment in themselves, and that's not a simple matter. The stigma associated with many of these middle skill jobs can often dissuade people, whether young people or older people, from entering career and technical training. We need to get past this and recognize that these mid-skilled jobs can be quite valuable to society and to the individuals who hold them. But the lure of college for all, even when it doesn't necessarily pay off, is very powerful. We are all of us in many ways prisoners of a prestige system that doesn't provide quite the clear-eyed investment in this kind of technical training and apprenticeship that we need. 
time binds and financial inhibitions make it difficult for incumbent workers to seek continuous education. And that leads them to vulnerability in later life. But no society can afford to have people who are 50 years old thrown out of work without options for reskilling, upskilling, and finding another way in the labor market. We need to make it easier for people to achieve training while they're on the job so that they never do become obsolete. So what are some of the organizational adaptations to skills matching? How can we do a better job? Well, my favorite systems are those in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, the dual education system, which so effectively provides this kind of technical training married to apprenticeship and gives people a lot of experience in the firms where they hope to go to work in the future and a very steady supply of the world's most trained, highly trained workers. In the United Kingdom, we see a, a less robust system, but nonetheless important apprenticeship system funded by a special tax on companies to support apprenticeship. In my country, the community college system has become an important supplier of this kind of training and education. And it's unusual. Very few other countries have invested as we have in a community college system. But it is another way to provide continuous training, opportunities for bespoke education, as community colleges often work in collaboration with employers. Online upskilling, or badges, we heard this discussed earlier today as well. These are short courses that are very specific kinds of training, just determined and decided in order to provide people with very specific skills that may be of use to them in the labor market. But what are some of the problems with these organizational adaptations that we need to keep in mind? I've already mentioned financing. How do we finance this kind of continuous education? We're actually having a hard enough time in my country figuring out how we finance traditional age education. The free rider dilemma, stigma, the need for credential recognition by employers, and the demanding rigorous fusion of technical education for general skills and apprenticeship for firm-specific skills. This is what we need most of all. So I think these, uh, this brief tour of how auto artificial intelligence is likely to affect the labor market, some of the adaptations that we might be able to engage in that will make a difference, and above all, a continuous investment in education and training so that we don't face the kind of obsolescence that fuels the anger and frustration that we heard about from the Swedish Prime Minister this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Kathleen. Well, I would like to share uh, with you that uh, in Korea we do have uh, Meister High School, which is Korean version. Uh, not similar to German um, Meister School, Meister Schule, I mean. And also we introduced uh, uh, working uh, with learning, mm -hmm. like il haksub byonghyangje, working learning, you know, uh, dual system. So I hope, you know, in your next book, you may include Korean, Korean cases as well. Yeah, as well. Good idea. Thank you. And next, uh, 다음 스피커는 우리 예, 지통량. 자, 큰 박수로 환영해 주십시오. Thank you, Professor Kwon. <웃음> A very good afternoon, everybody. I also apologize that I will not be speaking in Korean, even though this is my fourth time in Seoul. Um, and today, I will be talking about people analytics and the future of work. And, and to be honest, when the organizers first contacted me to talk about bridging the AI skills gap by reskilling and upskilling, I, I was really racking my brains. Like, how, how would I best be able to contribute to this conversation? As uh, the CEO and co-founder of a startup, uh, Engage Rocket, we, we, run, we help companies run people analytics, meaning uh, decisions around how you grow your talent, how you help them to feel like they belong to your company, and how you help them to perform in their job. Uh, we adopt an analytical approach to helping companies with that. So I thought, 
let's adopt an analytical approach to addressing the, the topic at hand today. So what I will be covering today would be a, uh, three things. So one, what, the why behind it. Why, why, why is there even an AI skills gap to begin with? Is there, is there uh, such a skills gap? And then I'll dig deeper into the who exactly can we upskill and reskill within a company, so getting very practical for uh, leaders within corporations. And then also, like, what, what are some of the things that actually need to be upskilled or reskilled in, uh, in this new economy? And I will be referencing some of what uh, uh, Catherine mentioned um, in later on the slides as well. So I'd like to ask all of you a question. What's the first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning? Open smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think Professor Kwan has hit it. I've asked this. This is the seventh Asian country that I'm asking uh, this question in. And I'd, I'd very much like to see a show of hands. How many of you wake up and the first thing in the morning, check your smartphone? I, I know I'm one of them. About, about more than 60% of, uh, of the... Actually, Easily 70% of the room. And in fact, that, that little smartphone uh, that sits in our pockets or our handbags contains so much more processing power than roomfuls of computers just 20 years ago. And when we think about the new basic human needs, some of you might have seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think Maslow is a little bit outdated. Now, now we need to look at... Wi-Fi, and more importantly, battery life. Some of you are running out of battery right now. But when we think about the, the Korean economy and how Korean businesses have been reacting uh, to, to these changes that are so fundamental to all of our experiences, there seems to be a bit of a usage gap. I was actually surprised that this, this data came from uh, one of the Korean media companies. 84% of the Korean population is active in social media, which uh, I, I, it's, it's one of the highest in the world. When we studied uh, in, my, in my previous life as a researcher, I looked at uh, internet penetration rates around the world, and South Korea consistently was one of the highest, if not the highest, uh, internet penetration uh, countries with internet penetration around the world. 84% of the population is active in social media. But with all that data that is being collected, actually only 5% of uh, Korean companies report that they make use of that big data. So there's a huge amount of uh, uh, usage gap here and probably explains, at least within the Korean context, what that AI skills gap is. It's partly from collecting and uh, categorizing and analyzing all of this data. But that's the why. Uh, or we're we're going to get into the, the deeper trends behind why soon. But, that, but that's the Korean context, and, and at least at a visceral level, why, why um, there is such an AI uh, skills gap in the market today. But I'll talk a little bit more about AI skills gap in the context of, of the workplace, where we all work and we go to office every day, uh, we do our jobs, we go home there's actually a lot of data that's being collected that may not be utilized. So the first thing I'll, I'll touch on would be the three big changes and the, why, the, the deeper trends behind why there is such a skills gap. The f uh, data is really the new oil. I, I think I don't need to, to, shed, uh, to belabor this point anymore with, with this audience. But the Harvard Business Review back in 2010 wrote about big data as the next management revolution. And why I like that piece so much is because it, it really categorize, categorizes very clearly for us today why today is different. Because every generation we go through technological revolutions and everybody in every generation claims this time it's different. This time it's different. And actually, you know, it, it's all a reversion to the mean. Uh, with the exception of maybe the Industrial Revolution back in the 1920s, which dramatically changed production. But today, I'm firmly of the belief that we are facing 
another revolution uh, that is equal, if not greater, in magnitude. And it's because of three Vs. The first V is volume. So we talked a little bit about social media data earlier, but more data has actually been generated just last year than in the previous 5,000 years of human history. If we pause and think about that for a minute, all these photos that you're currently taking, all the emails that you're responding to, all of this is contributing to that huge amount of data that is being generated uh, around the world. In 2018, I believe that this number will be even greater. Uh, IBM has yet to uh, uh, publish that data, but, but this, is, this is from their research reports. And basically, every minute of the day, if we you just take the time that it's taking for me to talk through this slide, there are 527,000 photos shared on Snapchat. More than 120 of you would have joined LinkedIn. Four, four million videos are watched on YouTube every minute. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you use Twitter, but 450,000 of uh, tweets are made. And on Instagram, and this number is fast uh, increasing, there are 47,000 photos posted on, on Instagram. And, and this keeps increasing. So that volume of data is uh, dramatically rising at an exponential pace. The second V is the velocity at which that data is transferred. So again, in just a few seconds, more data is passing through the entire internet than was stored across all the data centers that housed the internet just 10 years ago. Now, I can remember very clearly what I was doing 10 years ago. I was, uh, at that time, I was a naval officer, so I was a combat officer serving on board one of our ships in Singapore. And at that time, the, the internet to me was uh, a, good, a place for me to go and do a little bit of research. I participated a bit in social media, but, but that was pretty much it. And, and today, I can't live without the internet. My, my entire business is built uh, on the cloud. And, and, and I'm, I'm not the only one in this space. And because of, this, because of this pace of data transfer, more than 50% of leaders that PwC studied demanded data of any business event within an hour of occurrence. So not send me a weekly report next week, not I'll wait for the monthly meeting to talk about this, but one hour after a safety incident has happened, for example, or a new competitor has entered the market, I want to know everything about it. And that pace of business is reflected in the lifespan of companies. The age of disruption is not just a buzzword. If we look at a study done by uh, uh, Professor Richard Foster at Yale University, in the 1920s, on the S&P 500, it's an index of uh, large uh, companies based in the US, the average lifespan of a company on that index was 67 years, back in 1920, meaning if if I was a company on the S&P 500 in 1920, I could expect to continue on that index on average for the next 67 years. Today, if my company was in the S&P 500, within 15 years, I can expect to be kicked out. So what that means, I have less than 15 years in my company's lifespan to make a difference. So the pace of business has affected even large companies very, very dramatically. The last V that the Harvard Business Review talks about is the variety of data that's being collected. So all those smartphones that are in your pockets today, do you know what it's collecting from you? We all read the end user software license agreement. We scroll <laughs> through it and accept, right? We just accept. Do you want to take my passwords? Yes, accept. Uh, do you want to take my, uh, my friend's contact list? Accept. And we have no idea. The other day, I was, uh, I was driving, I got in my car, I was driving from home, going to work. And Google Maps pops up and says, time to get to work uh, is 27 minutes, whatever it was. And I, I stared at my phone for a while and think, I thought, wait, how, how did you know? And 
I, I, have, uh, I have Google Home at home as well. And uh, you know, Google says it's not recording anything. And I, I'm sure it's not. But it, what I do realize is that it's, rec it, it's translating my uh, voice to text at a ha far higher accuracy than ever before. If any of you are using Google Slides today, uh, you would find that they can actually live caption your presentation as you speak. It starts putting out captions and subtitles un under your, your, uh, uh, your slides. Now, the amount of computing power that goes into this with the Internet of Things, RFID, the amount of wearables, I, I'm wearing a Samsung uh, smartwatch. This is capturing my heart rate, it's capturing my stress levels. Um, it knows more about me than I know about myself. And it, it's very, uh, it's, it's scary, but I, I'm more excited by the opportunity. But this is the why. This is the why behind, uh, behind the fact that there's an AI skills gap. You're able to now apply AI to anything. And even within AI, there is machine learning algorithms, which, which deal with uh, large amounts of computation. There's uh, natural language processing, which is uh, making sense of the natural language that we use. There are uh, neural networks, which help uh, get to the, the stage of AI where a computer can almost think for itself. And this is where the skills gap is, because there's so many different branches, there's so many different applications. Within every single application, there, there hasn't been enough time in the market, in the world, to develop that much expertise. So every, the whole world, the whole workforce is learning as we're doing. But in terms of the what and the who to apply reskilling and upskilling, because we, we now transition to that, uh, how do we build skills? One of the most interesting things was, uh, number one, the people who are most receptive to upskilling or reskilling, to learning more, is not everybody in the workplace. What you would find is that only people who are naturally very motivated or who have been engaged by their company, meaning their company has taken the effort to care for them, to, to care for their development, and to care for their growth, and to encourage it. These are the ones that would naturally want to seek out new upskilling opportunities. At the same time, you'll find that traditional skills which have less to do with AI are also very much in demand. Because it is, trust me, it is not easy managing a large group of engineers. So one of the case studies that I'm, I'm looking at is, is manager capabilities in a firm that knows big data and AI like nobody else. Google. And in fact, what they did was they studied whether, whether number one, whether your boss was really necessary, and number two, if they were necessary, what kind of skills do they need to be able to lead teams of extremely intelligent engineers? This is, uh, uh, it's called Project Oxygen. Some of you might be familiar with it, but the, the Google teams in people operations, they undertook, uh, they undertook a project where they studied the performance of all the managers across Google, ranked them on a, on a performance scale, and they looked at their EES scores, or the employee engagement uh, survey scores. How, did, how were they interacting with their team, and how were they making the team feel like they belonged at work, or that they, they were motivated to learn? And what they found was that there was a, a, a broad uh, scatter plot of all the managers and their teams across this axis. And they wanted to figure out what, the dif what was the difference between managers and leaders in the lower left quadrant, meaning they were performing badly and were not able to motivate their teams, and those in the upper right <coughs> quadrant, where they were performing well and yet had teams that were very motivated and loyal to them. And what they found were eight characteristics of Google managers that really helped to drive both performance as well as motivation. Now, this is not 
AI analytics. This is relatively basic statistical analysis. But what it did was to flesh out immediately what are the important skills that are required. Because the, the technical skills of the engineers, these were, were given. They, the engineers would need to learn and, and grow themselves. The specific applications uh, cannot always be defined up front. You would find that job descriptions in this space, when they are written six months uh, ago, would no longer be relevant today. So what they needed was a good boss who were able to provide these eight things to them. Coach them, empower them. So a little bit about uh, uh, similar to what Netflix was talking about uh, this morning. Being very interested and genuinely caring about their direct reports. Uh, being productive and results oriented. Being a good communicator and, and listening. Not talking, but listening to their team. Helping their employees with career development and growth having a clear vision and strategy for the team, and then finally, having the technical skills themselves to be able to guide and lead. So, so this is a big question. So where, where should you begin with uh, what, thinking about what AI and data skills do you actually need today? To be able to run an analysis like what Google did, you don't actually need that kind of AI skill. So one caution to many companies is that don't just think because everybody's jumping on the AI bandwagon, I, I must go out and hire 50 data scientists. Because maybe it just takes a little bit of a shift in mindset to look at your work process and think about, do I really need AI for this? Uh, secondly, are there, is, are there people in my organization already that have these skills? Thirdly, and, and very critically, who has the leadership skills to be able to drive this forward? We're not looking for a genius. We're looking for a good leader. And then how do we engage this talent? How do we make them feel like they belong? How do we motivate them to, to make the right decisions for the company? And then if I do need to train anybody, where should I best spending spend these training dollars? Who should I be training? Should I be training those who are the most engaged? who actually will give me a return on that training spend? Or should I just choose people based on a random sampling of whoever raises their hands? So what, what we at Engage Rocket uh, firmly believe is that these are people decisions that need to be data-driven. So almost applying AI to bridging the AI skills gap. Thinking about who are the right people to invest in, what should we invest in training them, and what kind of impact do we expect on the business after making this investment. So this is, uh, this is where we, we spend a lot of time with our customers uh, trying to figure out uh, using our software. And at the end of the day, this is, this is the one key takeaway that uh, I'd like to leave with you. Traditionally, HR is seen as a cost center. You just take money from the business, you need, you're a regrettable expense in, the, uh, in the, the balance sheet. But studies have shown that for every $1 invested in HR analytics or people analytics, it yields $13 of return. And this is not just our data, this is data that uh, has already been published. Mm. And you'll find that if as HR, we can find ways to reduce talent attrition using data. If we can find ways to improve engagement of our teams, increase their productivity and develop good leaders, then I'd say that the $13 uh, return is actually very conservative. You can actually uh, probably yield much more than that. So I've, uh, I've actually published um, an ebook on this topic. If you'd like to uh, download it for free, it's, uh, you can just scan this QR code. Uh, and, and you'll be able to get uh, access to the ebook straight away. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, mm -hmm. look forward to your questions later. Well, Chitang, I appreciate your uh, presentation about uh, the you know data business, which is uh, which look, looks like a data capitalism. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So. <laughs> No, you know, I'm wondering how how do you motivate a AI <laughs> with battery? <laughs> Definitely. Okay, okay, think about that. Yeah.
세 분께서 각자 전문 분야에 대해서 발표를 해 주셨는데 지금 플로아에서 들어온 질문이 있어서 질문을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 지금 가장 많이 좋아요를 누른 질문부터 하겠습니다. 이거 아마 유선희 전문님한테 드린 질문 같은데요. 모 그룹사의 교육 담당자로서의 고민 상담을 드립니다. 자기 회사 밝혔으면 좋을 텐데 모 그룹 엄마만 좋아하는 것 같아. 모 그룹 부 그룹은 얘기 안 하고 모 그룹만 얘기합니다. 이 재교육은 구성원 중 성장 의지가 있고 능동적인 사람을 대상으로 포커스를 둬야 될까요? 아니면 포스코처럼 의지의 유무를 진단하지 않고 정계층을 향해 해야 할까요? 직원분들이 교육조차 일로 받아들이고 부담스러워하며 교육을 진행하더라도 의지가 없는 경우에 있어서 고민이 많이 됩니다. 답변해 주시겠어요? 음, 둘다 필요한 일이 아닐까 싶습니다. 아, 이것도 아까 우리 캐슬린 기수께서 말씀해 주신 것처럼 프리라이더가 분명히 있을 수 있어요. 그러나 회사가 한 방향으로 가야 된다라는 그러한 어, 슬로건 아래서 꼭 필요했던 어떤 변화 관리의 교육이었기 때문에 어, 이제 교육의 효과를 보다 보면 은 같은 목소리로 스마포스코에 대해서 얘기하고 같은 수준의 그런 얘기를 시작하기, 시작, 어, 하기 시작했을 때 아, 과연 교육의 효과가 나타나고 있구나 즉 아주 명확한 뭐 숫자적으로 얼마만큼의 효과가 있었다 이렇게 말씀을 드리기는 어렵지만 굉장히 저희가 그 마인셋 교육, 변화관리 교육을 진행하기를 참 잘했다 이렇게 생각을 하는데 이거는 말씀드린 바와 같이 필수 교육이었어요 그러나 저희는 또 선발 교육이라든지 본인이 원해서 하고 있는 어, 선택하는 그러한 선택 교육도 있기 때문에 아마 음, 본인이 의지가 있다라고 하면 어떻게든지 그런 어, 선택 교육들을 어, 좀 선택해서 이러닝이든 집합 교육이든 해서 본인의 성장은 본인이 책임진다라는 그러한 어, 그 동기를 가지고 성장하고 있지 않을까 싶고요. 어, 5년, 10년으로를 바라봤을 때 이렇게 어, 억지로 끌려다니거나 혹은 이렇게 어, 의지가 있고 동기가 있어서 자발적으로 학습하는 사람들에게는 결국은 그런 성과로 또 경쟁력으로 역량으로 이렇게 어, 편, 수준이 생기지 않을까 이렇게 생각을 합니다. 뭐, 올바른 답변이 되는지 모르겠습니다. 네, 채점은 어, 청중들에게 맡겨드리겠습니다. <웃음> 예. 네. uh, next question to uh, to uh, President Kathleen Newman. Well, it is understandable uh, that you know the AI will be repressed, uh, rep, 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 uh, will replace the, the middle level, uh, middle skilled, you know, labor. Um, in the process of, you know, the job polarization. Um, Uh, you uh, mentioned that you know the uh, the skilling and training in, is uh, necessary. But however, in Korea, you know the the flexibility of labor market is limited. So how are we gonna you know deal with that matter? Ah, well. Far be it from me to instruct this audience in how Korea should deal with the labor market strictures, but I guess I would say that necessity is often the mother of invention. And when the strain becomes so great that uh, you're seeing productivity losses and uh, market share losses, I would expect to see some adaptations. Remember, as I said, middle skill jobs don't just disappear. Aspects of them disappear and leave behind an upskilled version of those jobs. So what is most likely to happen, I think, is that AI is going to create sort of working companions to human workers, uh, which is what we see, for example, with call centers. You see a lot that's automated and then a piece that isn't. And so you end up with fewer workers, but the ones you have are more upskilled 
And if that technology then enables high levels of productivity, those firms grow, those industries grow, and you end up with more rather than less, but a more productive form. So I do think that uh, the lesson that I've been trying to teach here is that it's not simply wiping jobs out, it's transforming their character. And to enable the highest level of productivity out of the labor force, you need that continuous upskilling so that the highly skilled parts of those jobs, those middle skilled jobs that survive, are, can be handled by your labor force. And uh, I, I think that you will see changes begin to creep in around the edges of the Korean labor market, or it will see those industries migrate to other countries that will do that. 네, 답변이 된것 같습니까? Well, uh, you know, labor market flexibility is always matter in this country. Not on, uh, you know, the, I, I guess not only this country, but also the rest of the world as well. So, you know, Minister of Labor, if you were Minister of Labor here in Korea, how, how are you going to deal with that? Yeah. Well, I could, it's easier for me to speak about how I would deal with it in my own country, but I find that there are powerful incentives that can be provided by government agencies to make training grants available, and the companies that take them up and are successful at them will claim higher degrees of market share than those that don't. There is something beautiful about competition in capitalism. It tends to generate... Um, you know, winners and losers, and the winners uh, often are the ones that master these skill problems. Remember that these skill revolutions are not new with AI. We have seen many, many waves of change over time in uh, skill regimes in industry, and uh, we're not the first and we won't be the last to have to adapt to them. But if we can find ways to do so, then we can get around some of these problems of obsolescence, which I think are very threatening as the Swedish Prime Minister said this morning, very threatening to people who fear what technology will bring. But if we can persuade companies, uh, governments, educational in, uh, apparatus to respond to this need and enable that kind of continuous upskilling and training, then we will see that kind of adaptation develop in ways that will be more productive. It's not likely to be a, the situation in which wholesale jobs are wiped out they will change first. And the productivity of those companies that manage that change will enable growth in those industries. As I said, the, the tellers are a very good example where, you know, in theory, those jobs could have been wiped out, but in fact, it just made that so much more productive and easy that you saw bank branches grow and uh, the job loss mitigated. So it's a complex phenomenon and one that where adaptation to upskilling is, I think, the most pressing challenge. Upskilling is, yeah, I agree with you. Thank you so much. And next question goes to Mr. Chitang Long. Okay, so you talk about the three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. And also you talk about the people's decisions. But, you know, uh, it's a lot. To you know, to adopt, uh, your I mean, your suggestion is, suggestion is excellent, but it's too much to do at the same time. So, uh, what is the most important thing, you know, uh, do you suggest for us to uh, accept, you know, uh, I mean, to implement? What is the most important, you know, index, data index? Should it be managed by the company? Hmm. That's a very good question, uh, Professor Kwan. I, I think you're right. It's a yeah, lot. That's a question from the audience. Yeah. That's a, whoever asked it, really good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, there's a temptation when it comes to data and technology uh, to, to focus on metrics. And, and, and best practice metrics that exist. Um, and and, and this, you can slice this by uh, different industries. So telecommunications might assume that there are certain metrics that work well for them. Uh, manufacturing might have other metrics. And, and that, that's probably true. I think 
the, the number one thing that needs to change, at least when it comes to applying analytics to people, is, is a mindset change. To, to believe that, number one, you can indeed use numbers to quantify and support people's decisions. Uh, earlier, uh, the POSCO example is a really good one. After investing all of these man hours and money in, in this change management and training, it, it would support the case for that project so much more if we could say we anticipate that this would yield uh, a, a payback of 4x or 5x within the next three years. And are we on track to that payback or not? Uh, so, so being able to, uh, to, 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 to shift that mindset that yes, we, we accept that there are uh, challenges when it comes to making analysis about people. But if we look across the functions to marketing, to sales, to operations, they have similar challenges too. Being able to put together a, a data set that is tractable for analysis, uh, being able to make sense of that data and being able to then uh, translate that to a language that the business understands. I think that is probably m far more important than any single metric uh, that, that I would be able to share because these metrics would differ from company to company, uh, from industry to industry based on the different evolutions, uh, the, the, the stage of evolution that your company is in. What might be right for me to track in my company today uh, is probably very different from what you would need to track in your company. In fact, what I even for, I mean, I can speak from a startup environment. What I tracked six months ago that I felt was critical indicators of our company health are very different from what I track today. And obviously, there are some underlying uh, indicators, but, but when we apply our, our people analytics, we look at what, what, do we, how, what, what are some of the, the key traits of people that we hire in, 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 allow them, in allowing them to become successful in the company. Uh, for us, for example, we, we've just realized that uh, people who have made a career switch and who are uh, actively seeking new knowledge in the domain that they want to switch to, uh, these are the ones that become real subject matter experts and have the passion to drive forward their own learning without uh, leadership in my company having to force that down their throats. So then we start building ways and means of looking for this in resumes. How do we mm -hmm. then identify uh, people who are very self-directed in their learning? So obviously it's not perfect, but, but we're getting there. And, and I, I can say that maybe two years down the line, man, it, things might be completely different and we need to change the metric again. So you mean that uh, uh, each company needs to set up their own critical indicator? Just like your company set up the, you know, the critical indicator as your company has. Okay. Absolutely. I, I think uh, having that mindset to, mm. to, to narrow it down to those mm. critical indicators that matter for your company. And then also, I, I think at, attending sessions like this where you, you expose yourself to the possibilities of AI and data that can then tell you how to best get to those indicators. Because sometimes those indicators are... Uh, are not easy. Like uh, you go to a company and ask them, how much does it cost on average for you to hire a new employee? 40, 50% of companies actually can't tell you. They, they, they don't have that data. So having knowledge of how to apply analytics and AI to be able to extract that data from your existing data sets, I think uh, would then help. But that's a second order question. The first order question is what actually matters within my business? Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, next question goes to uh, Dr. Yu. Um, 전 uh, 사원을 대상으로 하는 기술 교육이 톱다운 방식과 의사 결정에서 시작된 것인지 궁금합니다. 아, 실제로 전 사원 대상으로 교육 진행 시 근무 공백이나 참여도에 어려움이 있는데 온 오프라인이 병행하신 on offline, branded learning, how is it? Specific learning method. Possible. 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 
어떤 데이터 지원 시스템을 구축하고 있나요? 예. 세 가지를 물어보신 것 같아요. 우선 이런 변화 관리는 사실 탑다운이 아닌 이상은 참 쉽지 않습니다. 그리고 저희가 굉장히 큰 항공모함인데 과연 이게 동쪽으로 가야 되는지 서쪽으로 가야 되는지 향후 50년에 뭘 먹고 살아야 되는지 이런 부분에 대해서 굉장히 그 경영층들의 고민이 많았다고 생각을 합니다. 그 중에 하나로 어, 이제는 산업, 어, 4차 산업혁명 시대에 우리가 어, 여기에 대응하지 않으면 안 되겠다. 어, 철을 생산하더라도 좀더 효율적이고 데이터 중심의 에러를 줄이고 그래서 원료값을 줄이고 또 생산비를 줄이고 대신 품질은 업그레이드하고 또 그러면서 사고도 줄이고 그러면서 고객이 필요한 부분을 적시에 어, 제공을 하려면 어, 그냥 사람, 사람의 판단으로 그간의 경험으로는 쉽지 않겠다 해서 이제 인공지능 시대에 빅데이터와 AI를 접목하자라고 큰 그런 스마포스코의 대전제를 내렸고 그래서 탑다운 방식에 굉장히 강한 그런 어, 드라이브를 거셨기 때문에 저, 어, 임직원들의 그런 어, 시간을 어떻게 보면 굉장히 아까운 현업에서 일을 해야 되는 시, 시간에 어, 저희가 어, 소집해서 그렇게 집합교육을 실행을 했고요. 어, 블렌디드 러닝은 역시 앞서 어, 프리 어, 러닝으로 다양한 그러한 그 학습 자료를 배포를 했고 집합 교육에서는 그런 부분들에 대해서 좀더 체계적인 설명과 토론 위주로 그리고 더 학습할 수 있는 분들은 스탠퍼드 대학이라든지 이런 무크 그 아까 코세라도 말, 어, 어, 말씀하셨는데 이런 무크 교육을 어, 일맥상통하게 연결을 해서 프리 그리고 본학습 어, 그 다음에 애프터스쿨 아, 애프터 어, 어, 그러한 클래스를 좀 활발하게 어, 활용할 수 있도록 그렇게 저희가 준비를 했습니다. 그리고 마지막은 아까 포스트 프레임이라는 그 디지털 플랫폼에 대해서 설명을 드렸는데 그 부분이 모든 데이터가 집결을 해서 어, 생산 현장 혹은 어, 사무계 업무 이런 부분을 총괄을 해서 어떤 기능별로 데이터가 자동으로 혹은 어, 사람에 의해서 좀 구축이 되고 관리되고 그러면서 어, 이것들이 좀더 많은 그런 데이터가 어, 좀 모아졌을 때 AI 기반의 최적의 그런 솔루션 의사결정을 해줄 수 있도록 하는데 이게 뭐 AI에 100% 의존하는 것이 아니라 역시 사람의 전문성 그 동안의 경험, 경륜, 기회, 기, 지혜가 필요하기 때문에 어, 많은 그러한 담당자들이 모여서 데이터에 대해서 서로 어, 해석에 대해서 의미를 부여하고 그 다음에 의사결정을 하고 또 AI가 주어진 그 솔루션에 대해서 어, 이것이 어떤 정도의 그러한 신뢰성을 가지고 있는지 이런 부분에 대해서 같이 학습하면서 함께 성장하는 것 같아요. 그래서 AI도 계속 데이터가 모일수록 더 똑똑해지고 또 사람도 그거를 통해서 오차를 줄이고 의사결정의 그러한 실패율도 줄이면서 더 지혜롭게 성장해 가는 것 같습니다. 네, 감사합니다. 아, 지금 시간이 사, 한 2분 30초 가량 남았는데요. 아, 많은 질문들이 들어와 있는데 이 질문을 아, 다 아, 드리지 못해서 어, 굉장히 송구합니다. 음, 아, 그럼 한 가지 질문을 하고 어, 마치도록 하겠습니다. 이 um, you know, labels of skill or reskill. Uh, you know, what is the role of the uh, government? Uh, and what is the role of the employer? And what is the role of the individual employee? That is the question. Well, I think this differs from one country to the next because our education systems, as they interact with government, differ so much. In my country, this tends to take the form of government offering grants to stimulate or incentivize certain kinds of transitions. So we are starting to see a lot more, and this is one of the few things that both right-wing and left-wing political figures can agree on, that we need to invest more in training. And so we are starting to see a lot more government activity in providing funding for apprenticeship, for example, and experiments in different countries with different tax structures to try and incentivize investment in, 
in apprenticeship. So I think this, it, it's really very much a function of how education responds to government more generally. Thank you so much. Uh, 그리고 직통령 어, 대표의 QR 코드가 뭐냐고 질문한 분들이 계신데 그 2018 HR 포럼 웹사이트에 들어가 보면 거기 어, 거기에 이분들이 발표한 에, 두 분의 그저 파워포인트가 있어요. 거기에 있으니까 그걸 찍으세요. 지금 그리고 포스코 인재 창조 원건은 비밀이라서 없어요. 아, 비밀. 네, 그러니까. <웃음> 오늘 들으신 분들만 아, 비밀을 비밀, 예, 공유한 비밀. 것입니다. 아, 대위 사실... 없습니다. 예. 아, 그래서 이 캐슬린 유만 아, 총장님과 아, 치통동 어, 대표님의 파워포인트는 우리 웹사이트에 있으니까 가서 참고하시고요. 예, AI 때문에 이제 사라지는 직업도 있지만 AI 때문에 생겨나는 직업도 있지 않습니까? 그런데 아까 어, 발표해서 볼것 같으면. 어, 그 AI 때문에 없어지는 직업이 있지만은 결국은 없어지지 않는 직업은 마음을 나누는 직업 같아요. 네, 마음은 우리가 만질 수도 없고 마음은 볼 수도 없죠. 네, 그, 그렇지만 마음은 느낄 수가 있어요. 근데 AI는 느끼는 걸 못해요. 네, 그래서 우리가 아, 느끼는 한 영어로는 feeling so good 그러죠. 예. 느끼는 한 음, 느끼는 직업들은 앞으로 계속 생성되고 발전될 것입니다. 아, 우리 그 발표해 주신 세 분에게 에, 감사하고 또 저기 이, 뒤에서 열심히 이, 통역해 주신 excellent interpreter들이 있어요. 인터프리터들 아주 비쌉니다. 아, 그분들이 아주 수고를 많이 해 주셨는데 그분들이 이제 커뮤니케이션을 위해서 고생하시니까 다 같이 그분들의 수고에 우리 감사의 박수를 보내면서 어, 세션을 마치도록 하겠습니다. 아, 여러분들 여기 오신 분들은 업스킬과 리스킬링에 전혀 문제가 없을 것 같아요. 네, 감사합니다.